Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great presentation on tap. This is a conversation. It's a discussion among five very, very smart people. I'm very, very, look, very much looking forward to it. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the discussion, you will have the opportunity to access it later. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience, although we won't be having a formal question and answer session. So any questions that do come in from the audience, these uh, very smart people, as I said, will be getting a copy of all the questions that came in, and I'm sure somebody from their organization will be more than happy to follow up with you offline to get your question answered. And we do have a couple polling questions during the course of today's conversation. So please uh, be aware, be alert, and hopefully we can get you engaged. And we also have a very, uh, very active chat uh, pre or th on, on the interface, the chat tab on the interface. So we do encourage you to uh, just chat us up, your questions, comments, suggestions, whatever you want to share with us, please go ahead and send it along. And then also, finally, at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully, you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's discussion, which is Comp Ops, how compliance operations help dev orgs conquer increasing regulatory hurdles. Our all-star lineup includes Shannon Smith, who is a security compliance manager at Armory. Andy Suderman, who is the Director of R&D and Technology at Fairwinds. Dr. David Yates, who is Associate Profes Professor of Computer Information Systems at Bentley University. Thomas McGonigal, who is the Cloud Partner Solutions Architect at Armory and the moderator for today's conversation. And finally, Dr. James Bland, who is the Global Tech Lead for DevOps at AWS. Thank you all for being on the webinar today. I am so looking forward to this conversation. And uh, as I said before, Thomas is going to be leading the discussion. So Thomas, I'm gonna hand it over to you, take myself off camera, put myself on mute, and I'll be back when we get to the first polling question. Thank you very much, Charlene. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here today. It's a pleasure to have all my, my old friends and my new friends here with me today and to kick off our talk, we're just gonna go around and we're gonna get the juices flowing by asking the question of all our panelists, what's their favorite movie and what's your favorite soft, uh, security software? And I'm gonna put that in the chat and if you could um, answer that for your, yourself as well in the chat if you could, while we're going through the panel and describing it. So my favorite movie is The Joker with Joaquin Phoenix and I was a big comic book kid and I just loved the movie very, very much. And my favorite piece of security software is NordVPN, and it's because how easy it makes a VPN and how uh, how how how, um, how awesome that is. Because uh, in the old days, I used to do uh, set up VPNs, and it's just so much easier now with Nord, and I just love it. Um, David, I'm going to go to you. What's your favorite movie, and what is your favorite security software? Uh, favorite movie is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, so true classic for me, and watched it many times. My favorite security software. Uh, it's not quite as old as Raiders, but um, I've been using malware bytes uh, for my personal security for a long time, and I love it. So, thank you, David. I'm going to move on to Andy next. Andy, what is your favorite movie and your favorite security software, please? Uh, my favorite movie has to be The Fifth Element. Uh, probably my first big introduction to sci-fi uh, when I was younger. So, uh, definitely one of my favorites. And my favorite security software. Personally, is uh, Proton Mail and Proton VPN combo. So, huge fan of that. Not a technically a security software, but it does keep me more secure. So, well, that's a great answer. I, I was looking at Proton earlier today, and I'm, I'm going to move on to James. James, your your cue. Yep, um, my favorite movie would be Matrix. Um, every time I watch it, I find Easter eggs in there, um, and um, it's a it's a true like a geeks movie. Um, uh, I just marveled at the way it was actually uh, made and produced. Um, for my favorite uh, security tool, not necessarily really a tool, but it's the Chrome Dever Developer Extensions. 
Um, I, I really find that you can really dig in and really find some interesting things in there, like um, what people kind of exposed uh, publicly, and maybe they really didn't realize it or not. Oh, that's a great answer. I'm going to steal that next time I ask that question. Um, and Shannon, what, what's your what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite security software? Yeah, so uh, I'm like a psychological thriller fan, and I'm really bad at remembering my favorite. But the first one I can remember is uh, The Secret Window, which is based off of a, a Stephen King long or short story, I guess. Um, but that's the, fav the favorite I can remember because it kind of introed me to, to that genre. Uh, and then favorite security app... I, I think maybe Jamf, which is more of a compliance app, but it ensures security controls. So that Ooh. that one's probably my favorite. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna return to that later on in the um, in the discussion. We can discuss what Jamf is and how we're using it, you know, for our compliance at Armory, for example. So uh, so I, I feel the need to really kind of introduce our, our webinar at this point. I wanted to once again thank our team um, and the panelists uh, for putting this together. But comp ops. Is a, is, a, is a term, it's an amalgamation or a, um, a, 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 a phrase that I came up with in 2016. And I'm going to put um, that into the Slack. I, I wrote a blog when I was at CloudBees, the, uh, the Jenkins company, on continuous compliance. And this blog article talked about the need to take the principles and practices of, uh, of, of DevOps and apply them to the field of compliance. And so we're going to be discussing that whole that whole sphere today. We're going to be talking about that whole in, like like all the nitty gritty, and, and we're going to dig into it with our panelists. And we're going to discuss it. But I feel the need that we need to discuss and we need to define um, each of the different components. We need to define DevOps. We need to define uh, security. We need to define DevSecOps. We need to define comp ops and compliance. And so I'm going to ask David Yates, Dr. David Yates, to define DevOps. So um, there's lots of definitions. Obviously, it's a contraction. So the goal of DevOps is to combine software development and IT operations. And uh, in terms of outcomes, it's really focused on shortening the systems development lifecycle and providing continuous software delivery of high quality software. And I would say critical success factors for DevOps operations or DevOps practices is inclusive teamwork and focus on a shared mission. I love that definition. Uh, it's a definition that um, I've used personally myself, and no one has ever really had a problem with it. It's it's all DevOps is all about the software delivery mission and delivering software to production. I just love that definition. It just it just encapsulates so much of what I do in the DevOps sphere at Armory and in my previous career working at at, at the previous companies I've worked at. Does, does any of the panelists? have any additions they want to add to this definition of DevOps, or can we move on to um, the definition of security? How does, how does everyone feel about that definition? I like it a lot. I think it avoids a lot of the pitfalls that we see in the definition of DevOps in the industry. Yeah, people do find it challenging to define DevOps, don't they? And I think there's a bunch of reasons for that, but what we're, ta what we're talking about is just a culture of software delivery and a culture of mission focus, and that really just encapsulates the way I think about DevOps. Does anyone have any other comments? Is, is, is there is there any um, dissenting views? Okay, so we're going to move on to security. Andy, would you mind defining security and um, and what it means to you? Sure. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, I lifted from Wikipedia a definition that I think is actually fairly apt, but uh, I can talk about how I think about it as well. Um, but uh, computer security, cybersecurity, or information technology security is the protection of computer systems and networks from information disclosure, theft, or damage to their hardware, software, or electronic data, as well as from the disruption or misdirection of services they provide, which is a fairly meaty definition, but I think it uh, encapsulates kind of the overall thinking of security. Um, the way I think about security is it's really a responsibility of every person that works in infrastructure or software uh, to keep in mind the risk factors associated with the things that they build. So understanding what your, you know, what your tolerance to risk is, what your, um, what level you're going to uh, mitigate that risk to, and um, keeping that in mind in, in basically everything that we do. It's not uh, a single department. It's not some one person's responsibility. It's really anyone who works on a system that is going to deliver software, in my case, because I'm in the software field, um, is responsible for it. Well, I thought that was a wonderful definition. Um, I'm, I'm chopping at the bit. I'm not going to ask the team to kind of uh, 
uh, discussed that definition, I felt it was really dead on. Um, but what I'm going to move on to quickly is to James and ask James for a definition of DevSecOps, which is the amalgamation of DevOps and security, and they're combined somehow. So if, if, if James, you wouldn't mind giving a definition of DevSecOps. Yeah, no problem. Um, so DevSecOps basically builds upon DevOps. Um, and I actually like the way the terms actually focus where um, security is in the center, um, because what it does is it kind of implies that security now has to be baked in, right? Um, so it's between, you know, it's not just between dev and ops, but it's baked into the whole process. So we've heard terms such as like shift left security, which is actually shifting left into the developers, um, you know, having them um, build in like security practices right from the get go. And it's also shift right security as well, making sure that we, we build in those um, uh, feedback loops on the right hand side. So then we're feeding back that information into developers and also um, taking care of security, you know, through the entire life cycle. Oh, I so love that's kind that. of DevSecOps. You know, to, to be honest, I never kind of realized the, the role of the sec in the middle plays as part of that term, right? It's in the middle, it's part of that shift left. Shifting security to the left. I love that definition. Thank you, James. And so yeah. I think I think what yeah, we're doing I've, I've we're, actually. We're... Oh, I was gonna say I I've also heard the term like um, DevOps sec. Um, I don't like that because then that also that that kind of implies that it's at the end where security is usually typically like in software development firms where a lot of times people think of it as like an afterthought. Hey, security is something we do at the end. So I I actually like it in the middle there. DevSecOps. Oh, I love that. I, um, I really, really admire that definition. I think it's wonderful. And what we're doing is we're establishing this kind of narrative, this flow. We started with DevOps. We talked about security. We talked about DevSecOps. Now we're going to get into compliance. What is the what is compliance? And then I'm going I'm to ask Shannon to define it. And um, and then we're going to discuss what does it mean for CompOps? What is how does CompOps fit in to all these other different buckets? Yeah. So uh, kind of the like. Uh, dictionary definition of compliance is the the actor process of doing what you've been asked or ordered to do. So for me, that looks like, okay, first identifying what you've been ordered to do, uh, whether that is through kind of an internal decision, you guys have decided your your internal roadmap that you want to take and, and um, an associated compliance framework with that, or maybe there's a, a regulatory uh, requirement or a contractual requirement on, on what you've been ordered to do. And then from there, it's identifying kind of the, the processes and the controls that need to be put into place in order to meet that framework and also auditing, reviewing, enforcing to make sure that those controls and processes are being followed. Wow, that was a great definition. Thank you, Shannon. That was really tremendous. Um, and now it's up to me to kind of tie all these components together. And so I, I shared the DevSec, excuse me, the CompOps blog from 2016. And what I was hoping to do was talk about how we can get compliance and how it relates to security and have it have it connected to DevOps and have the principles and practices of DevOps applied to it. And so uh, to start that conversation off, I thought um, I thought we should talk talk about the types of compliance and how we can start to enforce more DevOps and compliance into those compliance workflows and those types various types of compliance. And so um, if if if, um, if our, our, our original speaker, uh, Charlene, uh, wouldn't mind coming back on and, um, and, and, and posting um, a particular... Uh, um, um, polling question, I oh, got it. Man. I'm thank there, you. man. I, I, I have already pushed out the polling question. The first polling question for the audience is, my organization is most challenged by compliance for, you can choose from uh, SOC one or two, ISO 27001, comma, 27017, comma, 27018, uh, GDPR CCPA, PCI DSS, HIPAA slash high trust or other, and in which case, please put your answer in the chat. We'll go ahead and uh, leave the poll question open for a couple seconds, and then we'll take a look at the results. Sound good to you guys? Okay. All right, we're getting lots of results in so far, lots of responses in. So, um, and uh, uh, just uh, another quick reminder that that today's conversation is, as I said before, being 
uh, being recorded. So you will have the opportunity to uh, listen to the entire conversation again, or if you miss any of it, or if, like I said, if you just want to listen to it again, you'll be able to. We will be sending out an email link uh, to uh, access it on demand after we are done today. So, okay, let's go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. We'll take a look at the poll results. Okay. Really interesting. Yeah, it looks like the majority of folks are uh, most challenged by GDPR and CCPA. So it looks like privacy is a huge issue among a lot of organizations. And then there was a dead tie for second between SOC 1 or 2, the ISOs, and PCI DSS. And then we had 13% who were, who were stymied by HIPAA or high trust. Good stuff. Very good stuff. Um, you know, I, I feel like uh, this is pretty, probably pretty a good, good sample and pretty accurate for um, like the customers that I interact with as a solution architect at, at uh, Armory. And, um, you know, the, the, the crux of that original Comp Ops blog was that CICD is the perfect place to do compliance. And when I was when I wrote that up, you know, I was working at Cloudbeat, which is a Jenkins company. So CI was really kind of the focus of the Jenkins product. And now I'm in continuous delivery. I'm working on Armory Enterprise and Spinnaker at um, at Armory. And I have over the years shifted my thoughts that CD compl uh, continuous delivery is the perfect place to be doing compliance. And so I just wanted to open that question up to the to the panel and see if anyone has any ideas or thoughts about what does compliance look like? What do the gates look like in a compliance framework or a comp in a compliance continuous delivery uh, flow? What does that look like to anyone? Does anyone have any thoughts? And so just, just to kind of reiterate, so what, what I'm proposing is that um, Continuous delivery is one of the core uh, core values or core practices of DevOps, and we can introduce these gates. So, for example, we can gate on and make sure that the approvals are correct and accurate and have been determined and, and have been completed uh, to, to release software into production. So that's like an example of a gate in the and continuous delivery pipeline. And so there's there's a whole host of other uh, other various compliance and um, and, um, and 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 uh, excuse me, and gates that we can increase and and and, and continue and add to a continuous delivery pipeline. Um, and um, does anyone have any um, particular like feelings about? Uh, please, Shannon. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, in my past, I was a SOC two auditor. So uh, definitely familiar with the gates that need to be in place. Uh, to Thomas's point, approvals, that's a huge one. Segregation of duties uh, really depends on those approvals. So that's big. Um, you could also kind of build in uh, making sure that uh, the infrastructure is up to date, patches, security updates, that kind of thing, testing. Uh, so those are a couple that, that would be big ones that, that you can kind of incorporate into that pipeline. Please, Andy. Yeah, um, I mean, this is going to sound a little bit like a shameless plug, but this is something that we're heavily focused on in our SaaS offering is building um, an opportunity for people to um, build these compliance pieces into CICD and then also continually scan them afterwards. So taking open source tools like Trivi uh, and inserting them as a step in your CICD, inside your CICD pipeline to block things that are deploying known, known vulnerabilities, which satisfies some of your compliance um, points for continuous scanning and vulnerability scanning. Uh, in addition to that, having the opportunity to write custom policy using a framework like OPA and inject that. So if you have specific policies around how things are deployed or what your infrastructure deployment looks like, integrating that all the way down into the CICD pipeline so that it gets blocked before it ever gets deployed and we're not just checking it after the fact. That's, that's marvelous, Andy. Um, and so I, I want to kind of loop back to OPA, but first I did have a conversation with, with James in preparation for this call. And we talked about infrastructure as code and the role of a DSL or the role of a domain specific language um, and, and how that, what that could have in, which is an infrastructure as code, by the way, is a DevOps concept and what role that could play in a, in a, in a, in a, in a compliance organization or a compliance um, 
uh, opportunity. And so, um, James, would, would you mind kind of talking us through infrastructure as code and how what, how, what benefits compliance could benefit from infrastructure as code? Yeah, definitely. So infrastructure as code, for those who, that might not know what it is, it's basically defining your infrastructure using like a programming language or using a, um, uh, a uh, uh, some type of like markup language or configuration, if you will. Um, the beauty of it is, is that you can define these things and you can actually use a, a typical like software delivery lifecycle where you can actually develop this like configuration within a an IDE. And then because you have it in a, in a um, a configuration language, you can actually test against that, right? Like you can run, like let's say infrastructure as code, you could run like certain tools against it to make sure that it's actually meeting like the company's policies, um, uh, you know, as part of the development life cycle. So as a developer is working on this within the IDE, you can actually, you know, flag it like, hey, um, we don't allow, you know, as a policy, we don't allow like port 80 to be exposed, exposed externally. And so the developer, while they're having, while they have that context and that frame of reference, they can make that change right away. Or you can also pass this into other like um, gates or checkpoints within the, um, the software delivery pipeline. So as you're doing CI CD testing or you're doing other things like within the, um, the, uh, the delivery pipeline, you can actually check for other security violations as well. Um, within the code, because uh, like as you're as you're integrating some of these products, basically you can actually start stitching together some of these different components as they might have interacting or interactions that might violate or um, go against uh, company policies. I, I marvel at that uh, definition, James. I think that was really spot on. I think it was like a textbook definition. That was really 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 well done. Um, <laughs> I, I do want to loop back to the OPA piece that Andy mentioned. Andy, would you mind? articulating what OPA is and, and how it relates to your product. And by the way, you're representing Fairwinds today. Yes, hopefully you can see my jacket. But uh, uh, OPA or OPA um, is a, uh, it's an open framework for writing policy basically. So it's based on uh, Rego, which is a language for writing policy. Essentially you can, you can write a check against any sort of structured data that you might come across. So this applies to HCL that you would find in your Terraform code, which is an infrastructure as code tool, or you can apply it to, you know, in our world, we're very focused in the Kubernetes world. So we're looking at Kubernetes YAML manifests that define how things are deployed. And so you can write a policy that says, you know, you can't deploy this container that is running as root, which is an insecure configuration into your Kubernetes cluster. And so we can check that in CI CD. We can, you can also write, you know, admission controllers to prevent that from ever being deployed, or you can check and just alert on it, you know, while it's running in your environment. Oh, marvelous. And so I, I just posted a link to uh, about 20 Rego examples in case anyone is, is, is curious. And so these are all re examples of Rego, which is the OPA language that defines various gates within Armory Enterprise. And so we can gate based on any of these exa various examples. And, and, and those examples were, were are, are those um, articulations were, were articulated by Shannon. Um, Shannon, not, not to put you on the spot, but could you go? Could you repeat maybe some of those um, those particular gates that you mentioned only a couple minutes ago? Um, for example, the, uh, the the approval, and then there was about four or five others. Do you remember them? Yeah, so you can have like a, a manual judgment stage. Uh, you can enforce testing, uh, kind of a, a double check to make sure that your infrastructure is up to date and security patches and updates are applied. Well, that's marvelous. Thank you. I um, I was having trouble recalling them, and I, thank you for I put you on the spot, but thank you for uh, for nailing it. That was that was great work. Um, and so, so we have these these various products that are leveraging this tool called OPA. We have we have Armory Enterprise, and then we have Fairwinds. And what what is the name of your product, uh, Andy? I didn't catch it. Uh, Fairwinds Insights. Insights, insights. And then um, there are, there are other products in the market for compliance, and they do um, various similar things. I'm not sure if anyone saw um, the, the announcement yesterday, but CloudBees came out with CloudBees Compliance. And then um, when I wrote the blog article five years ago, uh, Chef had Chef compliance, and um, and and I believe I'm not I'm not 100 sure, but I believe the product has changed names and it's now called Inspect. Has anyone had, here on the panel had any experience with these compliance specific tooling to to ensure compliance for your infrastructure for your product 
for you know to enforce these gates. I know you know Andy and I have our own respective experience with our products. Does anyone have any other outside experience? Does, does that ring a bell with anyone? Uh, this isn't as much focused on kind of the dev pipeline, uh, but there also are compliance automation tools out there that kind of cover uh, com the compliance controls more holistic. Uh, so there's like Drata or Hyperproof, where you can kind of uh, plug in your SOC 2 controls and they'll monitor like AWS and, and make sure that your SOC 2 controls are compliant. So not quite as much the, the development pipeline, but a little more of a holistic uh, look at it. Oh, wonderful, Shannon. Thank you for that. We, um, um, please. Sorry, we recently went through a SOC 2 audit and um, we partnered with a company called Content, which has a simple similar... Uh, style of interface where they, it's an entire compliance program, but some of it's automated. I'm curious to find and or see, you know, different um, open source or or closed source or, or SaaS offerings that kind of integrate both those approach, both the CI/CD approach and the you know a holistic compliance piece, and tie them together. Whether it's via integrations with some of those or uh, things like that, I'm curious if anybody's encountered that. I, I, I'm curious about that myself. Uh, does anyone on the on the panel aware of what Andy just said? If, if there's a compliance, holistic compliance tool that's tied into a CI/CD workflow, does anyone does that ring a bell for anyone? No, they don't know it. This is this is the, the opportunity of a lifetime, apparently. This is I, I think you're. I think you're. On in our private time. So I, I think you're. I think you're spot on there, Tom. I think uh, one of the problems is in this space. There's a lot of point solutions, um, and they, they're not necessarily well integrated. So for people who are out there doing this in the practice, I think it's um, it's a real challenge. And, and one of the reasons I liked your insight about, um, you know, sort of CD being uh, an important uh, point to, to take care of this problem. The thing I love about that is um, if I return to James and Shannon's thought about, you know, well, I need to look to my right and look to my left. If you're sitting in the CD space, you can look to the left and assure not just the policy, but hopefully some of the mechanisms as well that are implementing the policy. And if you look to the right as your code goes into production and you're doing your um, operations and monitoring there, you're assuring that not only is your code functioning, but it's also functioning in a way that's securing um, the hardware, the software, the code, the data that you're the custodian of as you, as you deploy that app. And for me, I, I have not seen anything in the market that kind of addresses that full life cycle, you know, like from end to end. Um, and I do see that as a gap, right? But I, I do see a place where like OPA or OPA can actually fit in perfectly. Um, because what I like about it is that it, it actually separates the, you know, the, the policy and the enforcement. Um, and so this way you can take a generalized like policy engine and then you can take the enforcement and then plug that into every stage of like, you know, your software development lifecycle. Because like we all know, like the does the policy really change whether this is happening at the developer side or whether this is happening at the op side? You know, probably not. Right. I mean, the policy is still the same. And so if we can have a consistent way of kind of um, of enforcing or actually applying that policy at each and every stage, I think it actually makes it more effective. And because also, um, too, things change between like uh, that's why we have the also the concept of drift. Right. Um, so you might actually be checking the policy at the very beginning, like as a software is developing it or, you know, like uh, working on the product. Um, but then you also can have changes that actually happen in the UI that are like out of band. And so then we have drift. Um, and so things need to happen at every single stage. And you also have to be doing this continuously. Otherwise, you know, you're 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 going to fall out of, you know, like out of, out of compliance or be, you know, like and have serious problems with drift. James, I'm going to I'm going to direct this question at you um, in, in the chat. Jesse Sanford, who I've been emailing back and forth with. Um, hello, Jesse. Um, <laughs> He asks, aren't we really talking about hardening software supply chains? And I have an opinion about that. I just wanted to get what your impression is based on what you just said. Because um, I, I do have an opinion about this, but I wanted to hear your thoughts first. So what, what was the question again? Hardening no, sorry. software supply are we, chains? Are we talking about hardening software supply chains? And so uh, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just kind of start talking and then you can jump in when, when, when your, your, your thoughts formulate. So, so I, I'd argue that we're yeah, not, so, right? If my understanding of, of compliance is correct, compliance are rules about the software hardening, right? They're not the how-to. They're not prescriptive, right? Is that correct, Shannon? 
That is correct, right? Uh, it would depend on the compliance framework, but a lot of the times it is more, uh, it's not as, as prescriptive. And so, so I would argue that with, with compliance, due to its lack of prescription, we're not enforcing supply chain uh, software hardening. We're, we're, we're creating a shell or a concept to enforce uh, overall general security and best practices, as opposed to, look, you have to peg your, your, your Docker container to a particular uh, release and, and, and you know, the different prescription, prescriptive things like I'm sure Andy's very familiar with in Kubernetes and Docker, you know, all the different security uh, best practices that you can do for a particular uh, Kubernetes installation. Like compliance isn't necessarily that. It's it's this general best practices and and, and how to achieve that. Does anyone have any thoughts on, on what, what Jesse was asking about? So I, I have one quick thought. And I, I would say that what he's described, the hardening of the software uh, supply chain is really important. And, and I'd go further. It's necessary, but not sufficient to achieve compliance and uh, and uh, the the level of compliance operations that's needed for most practices. It's one small part of a very large picture. Right. Maybe not small, but it is one part of a very large picture. Right. Yeah. You know, on that note, um, I'm going to post in the chat, and the, the formatting is a little a little hanky, but if you guys can read it, there's there's various practices of DevOps, right? Practice one is configuration management. Practice two is continuous integration. Practice three is automated testing. Practice four is infrastructure as code. Practice five is continuous delivery. Practice six is continuous deployment. Practice seven is continuous monitoring. And so I'm just gonna start with practice one. Is configuration management, for example, Git and version control being leveraged in the con compliance space today? Is anyone aware, you know, obviously with Rego, right? Like we can, we can store our Rego, uh, our Rego uh, programs in, in a um, in a Git repository, right? So that's an example of it. Is anyone aware of other of, of compliance and version control outside of um, OPA? I would say it's a big component of compliance. Um, auditors usually want to see that you are performing peer reviews. We don't want the same person who developed a piece of code being the one to push it in. Um, also, you can kind of set up testing throughout and integration testing, unit testing using uh, GitHub. Um, another piece would be for business continuity purposes, the fact that you do have uh, the versions available. Yeah, I think there's two. Very well put. There's two I, I facets to the um, question, right? Please. There's the, is it part of co like achieving compliance, but is it also being used in the practice of like, um, achieving compliance. Does that make sense? Like you have to, is it used as a tool for checking and monitoring compliance as well? Uh, I think it's what kind of what you were alluding to Thomas with talking about Rego and, and checking in your policies and maintaining those, but also uh, there are systems out there like um, Terraform cloud has the, the Sentry policy that you can apply, which will also integrate with your uh, infrastructure's code. Uh, and then um, Pulumi also has a policy engine as well that you can plug into your infrastructure's code um, and manage. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm seeing this questions. more and more where there. Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, I'm, and I'm seeing it more and more, right? Vendors are putting this into like their, uh, like Git, GitHub is a great example, right? Where you can um, enforce policies at GitHub, like you can do pre-check-in um, pre commits. Um, so like make sure that people don't have um, like secrets that they've actually put in their source code and you can actually prevent it from actually being committed right at the, right from the get-go. Um, and then also, you know, like enforcing, um, um, you know, like uh, let's say if your organization has a, um, a policy on that, you know, like pull requests need to be reviewed by two two independent reviewers. Then you can actually have that before you can merge. So things like that. I'm, so I'm seeing it in the the configuration management piece. Um, them using that to enforce policy, or or at the very least, create guardrails. I, I think that's a, a great, great, interesting comment. You know, it's the creation of guardrails. And I'm going to ask a question of the team of the, of the presenters. Um, and I, I'd like to poll each of you. And I'm asking this question with my tongue firmly in my cheek. Is so, so if if a, a compliance expert is using um, is using configuration management, for example, Git and GitHub, are they doing DevOps? And so I, I'm going to start with you, David. 
David, yeah, I, 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 I think there, you know, that's a, that's a step on the journey, but it's not a complete step. Um, so one of the things that, uh, and this is a paradox, I'll throw it out there now, uh, a lot of people talk about immutable infrastructure as best practice. And part of that is, you know, um, uh, configuration. The problem is there's usually an S at the end of that. There's immutable inf in, in, uh, infrastructures. So once you have that, um, e like even in James's world, right, people have different AWS baselines and images that they create that they don't change, but they might have 10 of them even to run, um, you know, three or four apps. And so if, if there's 10 of them, are they really immutable or are we just doing some sort of version control around configuration management and the, inf uh, the infrastructure that they're configuring? David, are you saying yes? Are you saying no? <laughs> I'm saying, uh, no, I think you had it right. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm hedging. Uh, no, I would say yes. But again, necessary, but not sufficient. Well, that's, that's, that's very good. Thank you. Thank you. Shannon, I'm going to go to you. What do you, how do you feel about it? So once again, with the tongue in cheek, is, is a compliance officer using GitHub, a GitHub, a DevOps engineer, or are they doing DevOps? I mean, um, I would say yes, just from my experience. Uh, I know at Armory, we, we do store, uh, our infrastructure as code in, in a repo. And so I would say it is, a uh, it is DevOps. Well, so I, I'm just going to, before I go to uh, uh, James and, and Andy, I just want to, uh, this, this, once again, define DevOps, right? According to David's definition, it's a culture of mission focus and software delivery, right? And so if, you, if that is the definition of DevOps, I'm gonna now turn it over to James and get his, his answer. Um, James, yes, no, maybe? Um, yeah, maybe. Um, and the reason I say maybe is because I kind of, uh, uh, I fall in the line where I believe the definition of, of DevOps is more along the lines of culture and philosophy, and it's not a tool. Right. Um, and so if that's how your company is achieving, um, you know, your policies or, you, uh, or or whatever you're trying to do, and that's what you call DevOps, then yes, then yeah, you know, of course it is. But um, is it absolutely necessary to do that to achieve DevOps? Absolutely not. I've actually seen companies achieve DevOps um, in a very non-technical way. Right. You know, like um, they were actually able to, you know, like speed up their releases of features and functionalities into, you know, production environments with, with zero changes to technology. They, they weren't even using a repo. You know, they basically just made a cultural um, understanding like, Hey, we're just going to go faster in a hot, you know, and then let, let the, let the um, processes kind of like shake themselves out. I love that con the concept of, of the importance of speed to DevOps. That really appeals to me personally. Um, but wait, I'm going to circle back to that. I'm just going to ask Andy the, the last question uh, the, for the final polling. Um, yes, no, maybe, Andy, what do you think? I'm going to agree with James 100%. Uh, it's possible, but that is that is a uh, a symptom, not a not a cause. So I'll, I'll say um, I believe that uh, version control and adequate version control, especially with the, the advancements of the how advanced GitHub and Git are, um, they are they are prerequisites for DevOps. I think I'm going to say a strong maybe myself. Um, I think I think it's uh, I think I think we all kind of landed there. So I'm just going to move along. Um, practice two, um, according to the, the DevOps practices, is continuous integration. Um, I'll just quickly define continuous integration for anyone who doesn't know. It's when you build and test your software, and um, there there are various continuous integration platforms out there. And what would be an example, I guess this, is, this question is directed to, towards you, Shannon, um, what would be an example of building and testing compliance software? Um, would it be, you know, we, I, once again, I keep thinking of compliance as this rules infrastructure. Um, and and, and how, do you, how do you build that, those rules and then test them in a continuous integration way? Does that strike a, or does that ring true to you or, or possible to you? Yes. Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is like a GRC tool. Um, and I, that might just be coming from a more, way more compliance end of it. But uh, GRC tools kind of allow you to put your controls in and kind of track towards uh, the completion of, of uh, satisfying those controls. 
In regards to the continuous integration, I'm, I mean, again, from a compliance standpoint, it kind of does track your progress as you go along, but uh, I'd, I'd be interested to hear from, from the rest of the team from a more DevOps perspective. Any thoughts, team? I love what Shannon said, and I, I think it's a reminder to us all that the part of these um, problems in compliance and compliant operations, you need sort of technology assistance along the way, but you're largely solving human problems uh, in terms of being compliant with something like one of the SOC standards or PCI DSS and, and sort of where we started out in our first poll, right? So it's, I, I think um, technology is part of the answer, but you're essentially you need process and people as well. Uh, and so that's part of what's needed to um, uh, achieve what Shannon has described. I think I think if we were all to do a thumbs up, maybe, or a no, I think we're like a soft no, I think, from what I'm picking up from the, uh, yeah, kind of a, 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 maybe it's not a hard no, but I think continuous integration is a much, a much harder DevOps practice to enforce in compliance than, for example, uh, configuration management is, right? Configuration management, it's just obvious to all of us as, as this potential uh, win for DevOps to be included into a compliance life cycle. I think the, configure, the continuous integration is a little bit tougher. Um, I think the next one is, is a big, is going to be a strong yes, and that's automated testing, right? Um, how can you do compliance without testing, right? And how can you do testing without automated testing? That's really kind of my, my chain of, of thought processes. Does anyone have any thoughts about automated testing and its relationship to compliance? Uh, I don't know that it's always being used, but I think it is definitely beneficial uh, in the compliance realm, uh, whether it's by using one of the tools mentioned, like a GRC or a compliance automation tool, or um, even one of the, the pipelines that we've referred to adding in that automated testing. I, I mean, it's just always more efficient. Uh, I have to do quite a bit of manual testing in my role and the amount of time I spend on it is is ridiculous. So yeah, I think it's a big thumbs up. Big thumbs up. Does anyone on the on the on the call have a um, have a, a background in testing? I, I, I just don't know. I don't know your backgrounds well enough, no one. Because um, I, I certainly don't. Um, I was wondering if anyone had a particular perspective on on testing and how it applies to compliance. I just wasn't I wasn't sure. But if, if we don't have, if no one has any uh, background in it or, or, or thoughts, or, or David, were you going to say something? So I, I, I've been um, doing some consulting with a client recently, and and they actually don't use the word testing here. They use uh, automated assurance. So mm -hmm. one of the goals of a, a security policy framework and uh, the mechanisms to achieve it is that you need to sort of continuously assure it. And so in order to do that, you need to automate your assurance, whatever that is. So if I listen to what Shannon just said about how much she has to do by hand, and I'm so sorry, you know, if, if she had automation that was giving her some assurance along the way, uh, she'd be having uh, fewer late nights uh, at Armory, I imagine. Yeah, well, but um, if I'm reading, if I'm reading the room correctly, I think we're kind of a, a strongish yes on automated testing. Yeah. It's a very, very important practice to continue uh, to compliance, right? And then, uh, James, to put you on the spot, I was hoping if you could give kind of a, like a, uh, a, an overview of infrastructure as code again. You, you, you covered it earlier. I was hoping if you could just, just kind of repeat that definition and that explanation of infrastructure as code. Yeah, basically, infrastructure as code is um, uh, codifying your infrastructure using, you know, like the best practices of, um, uh, you know, it's, configuration or, you know, like using a, even a Terraform, like an HCL language um, to define all the resources that you're going to do. And it it's, makes the most of sense in, uh, when we're talking about cloud, um, because cloud, everything's kind of defined as, um, uh, as code, if you will, or as software. And so what I find fun, particularly interesting about your definition was the codification, right? The codification of the infrastructure, the codification of the infrastructure, the cloud, and whether you're using HCL or whether you're using cloud formation or whatever you're doing, right? It's that codification of your infrastructure. And so I'm going to ask the question, I'm going to pull the, the, the team again. Is codifying your infrastructure a form of compliance? Is that is that good enough for it to be compliant? And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say I'm gonna give a strong yes 
on that answer that question. Not to not to make you guys sway you in any way, but I'm just I'm just I'm just putting that out there. I think just codifying your infrastructure as a form of compliance. And so David Yates. Uh, did you have a sense for that answer? Yes, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. My only add would be you, you better be testing what you're codifying, right, a against your security practices. But assuming you're doing a, a, a thorough and an automated job of assuring the security of what you're codifying, yes, I'm good to go. Yeah, and just to double down on what David said, um, yeah, I, I agree. Codifying it is one step, but you do def definitely have to test it. Otherwise, there's, you know, what was the point in codifying it if you're not going to test it? Or in, in terms of compliance. And you alluded to Andy it earlier. To as well. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, you alluded to it earlier, James, is that also you, not only do you have to test it, but you also have to make sure it, it you don't have drift um, because this, uh, if you don't do that, then you're easily falling out of compliance. So I'll triple down on what you said and add that. <laughs> so, so I think I'm going to go to Shannon and then we're going to we're going to discuss. Go, go ahead, Shannon. Yeah, I, I would say it's important to kind of uh, identify your hardening standards. Uh, as, as a piece of that. And then you can totally enforce that through the infrastructure as code. I definitely agree that testing it is, is huge. Also locking down the ability to then make those edits. Uh, so you have a little bit more assurance that, that you're staying in compliance. Oh, great point. That's a great point. So, so I just wanted to kind of double down and repeat. So we're talking about a one, two punch, but we're talking about codification and then the testing of the codification, right? And so that makes me really rethink uh, practice number three, which was automated testing, right? So is if you're doing automated testing of your infrastructure and your software delivery and, 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 um, maybe that's a strong yes now, maybe. Does anyone have any, is anyone else rethinking uh, uh, number three, the uh, practice number three, automated testing? I think we were already a strong yes. Yeah. We were already a strong yes? Double. Double strong, yes. So, so I'm sorry, I got, I got lost in my, in my, in my diatribe. Um, yeah. So I'm going to move on to practice number four, five, which is very, very um, near and dear to my personal heart, and that's continuous delivery. It's what I do for a living. And, um, you know, at the beginning of the session, I did go off on a kind of wax philosophical about how continuous delivery is the perfect place to do uh, compliance, right? Have the gates and have all these, 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 these places. And so I'm a very strong yes. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change up the order just to make to keep everyone on their toes. So I'm going to start with Andy. Andy, how do you feel about continuous delivery? Yeah, I would agree. It's an excellent, uh, excellent place to be to be practicing, you know, automation of your your compliance program and really making those checks happen. Um, I, in my head, continuous delivery falls right alongside infrastructure's code because when you deploy software. You know, especially in a Kubernetes world, which I always come back to, you know, you're deploying things just like you do infrastructure. You have code that defines what your deployment looks like, and you're testing that and making sure it deploys correctly. And then you have policy that defines how it should be deployed. And so in my head, they're not exactly the same, but they're pretty darn close. Great. And I'm going to move on to Shannon. Yeah, I, I mean, similar to how we uh, we talked about at the beginning of the chat, I definitely think it can be used as as a tool to kind of further your compliance goals. Perfect. So these are all strong yeses um, so far. So James is last. James, do you have a uh, you have a, a contrary opinion? Uh, no, I agree with everybody else. That, that's you know the the goal of continuous delivery is to make sure that you have um, an artifacts or you have something that's um, deployable to production environment for um, continuous deployment. So um, and part of that exit is the criteria is that you know it must be compliant. So perfect. Well, well put. Well put. So I think I, I think frankly I think the next uh, practice number six is arguably the most interesting discussion uh, point about the various practices. For um, for anyone who doesn't know, there's, there's continuous integration, there's continuous delivery, and then there's continuous deployment. And continuous delivery has a gate uh, you know, where, where you don't push to production unless that gate, for example, a manual judgment. When I say a manual judgment, that's like a, an armory enterprise thing. But when you have a, a manual step that requires you to judge whether or not to push to production. That's the, really the definition of continuous delivery. Continuous deployment is you automatically just don't have that gate and you automatically deploy to production. And so you need to have all these practices and they need to be really strong. You need to have infrastructure as code, you need to have configuration management, you need to have CI, you need to have C continuous delivery all worked out to the point where you're just automatically pushing to production, right? And so I would argue that 
continuous deployment, if you are trying to achieve it, requires more DevOps, more comp ops, more compliance than than and than you can even imagine. It's just it's just in order to push to production automatically, you need to have the best compliance operations infrastructure and practices you can imagine, right? And so so I'm a a, a strong believer that it's not like I'm putting the the, the heart the horse before the cart. You know, you need to have all these practices before you can do can and, and compliance in order to do compl continuous deployment. I'm arguing. Is that I feel like I'm not being clear. David uh, Yates, would you mind kind of clarifying what, what I'm trying to articulate? So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, I just want to sort of try and put some shades of gray there. So one of the things we talked about at the beginning of this panel was having the decisions around uh, security and compliance and DevSecOps be risk driven or based on risk. So I, I think there are times when uh, that production pipeline you were describing from integration uh, to delivery to deployment can just flow right through. But um, if there are significant changes happening, like let's say you're changing your code and your infrastructure at the same time, you also want to be able to hit pause and perhaps do a manual judgment when the compliance risk or the production risk uh, goes up. And so I, I actually think you need some sort of adaptable policy there that brings a human in the loop where needed, but lets things flow automatically if the risk is low. Thank you, David. Does anyone else have any um, particular thoughts or feelings about this topic, about continuous deployment as it relates to, uh, to compliance? I, I definitely uh, agree with David. I think something like that would be awesome. Uh, and, and Thomas, I agree with you too. It, you really have to have the rest of your ducks in a row in order to kind of be at a spot where uh, auditors or anyone else will be comfortable with a uh, with continuous deployment, like you, you really have to have those other controls and and uh, uh, practices that we've talked about in place and and functioning well. Yeah, and I and I would say like my, in my interactions with customers, I think that that um, they want to all achieve continuous deployment, but then um, I, I don't know if the industry or the um, or if their comfort level. Um, is actually there yet. A lot of people do like, um, you know, continuous delivery and then they have a checkpoint and then they do, you know, like um, even a human reviewer or something, but uh, definitely continuous deployment is something they want to get to. It's just um, most people just don't have that comfort level yet. Yeah, it's really a, um, what's the right expression? It's really like a, a moonshot for most companies, right? It's really the, the goal or the dream, right? Yeah, yeah, well put, James. Uh, Andy, any any thoughts? Uh, nothing in particular. Okay, okay, got it. Um, and then I think the last um, last uh, practice is continuous monitoring. And is continuous monitoring just a synonym for compliance? I'm going to go with no, Tom. So we okay. just got a comment from Jess again in chat. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to paraphrase um, uh, Jess's insight that it, it doesn't all end with CD, right? Like you have to be looking at what's going on in production. And so if you're assuring policy, uh, I think James articulated this early, the policy stays the same where you are in your dev versus your ops uh, moves. And so if you push to production, you still need some mechanisms to assure that your policy is being enforced. So it's not just about the software supply chain. It's not just about CICD. It's also about the continuous monitoring, which I think is your seventh principle, right? It's about assuring that what you have running in production is also secure. Um, and then um, folks like Shannon need to give it the thumbs up and assure compliance along the way. Yeah, and I mean, the monitoring is is super important for identifying if something has gone wrong. Uh, after the fact, um, you can have like a file integrity monitoring, uh, also monitoring just of the configurations, kind of going back to uh, practice number one, the configuration management, like those should be reviewed continually. Uh, if you can get that uh, automated continuous monitoring, then that's the, that's the sweet spot. Oh, well put. Well yeah, and I don't want to conflate like monitoring with, um, you know, like uh, compliance as well, right? Because monitoring has different uh, goals that you're trying to achieve in it, right? So you may be looking for bugs or, you know, like downtime, things like that, SLAs that may have nothing to do with uh, compliance. Yeah, 
And so uh, maybe it's just semantics, but don't you don't want to necessarily conflate the two. Well put, well put. Um, any any other any other comments? We're actually at, at the, the the end, um, and I just want to wrap up. And then we have a giveaway, and we have a poll uh, to left to to, to run. Um, so does anyone have any other comments? I'm just going to wrap it up in ten seconds. Okay. Um, thank you to all of the attendees, and thank you to the presenters. Uh, truly a heartfelt uh, thank you to all of you for listening to our discussion today about comp ops. It's been a tremendous pleasure. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to um, our friend um, uh, Charlene, who's going to who's going to uh, who's going to uh, do the second poll and is going to um, is going to uh, do the, the 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 gift card giveaway as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's go ahead and take a look at that polling question before we uh, close down the webinar. Do the giveaway and close out the webinar. The second polling question is, where is your organization in your compliance automation journey for software delivery? You can choose from completed. 50% uh, automation of compliance operations is a work in progress. 10% uh, compliance operations is a collection of ad hoc processes. Uh, planning for after 2021 or other. Go ahead and put your answer in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and leave this polling question open for a little bit while I go through the final closing housekeeping items. Uh, just a quick reminder that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the conversation, or if you just want to watch it or listen to it again, you'll have the opportunity. We will be sending out an email after today's webinar that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to devops.com slash webinars, look in the on-demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Also, for anybody who uh, did put in a question during the question and answer period that was not discussed during the, uh, the webinar, please uh, know also that uh, the fine folks uh, on today's webinar, specifically those guys over at Armory, are going to get a copy of the questions who came that came in uh, that was not addressed during the webinar. So I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline and get your question answered. Okay, uh, let's go, let's close out the poll. Let's take a look at the results and then we'll do the drawing for the, uh, for the Amazon gift cards. The question was, where's your organization in your compliance automation journey for software delivery? Uh, looks like the largest number of folks, a largest percentage of 41% said that they are only at about 10% that compliance operations is a collection of ad hoc processes. Uh, the second largest number was 24% who said they're planning for after 2021. So why put off today, which you can do tomorrow, right? Um, uh, so 18% uh, said they, they're actually completed. And then uh, an sim similarly, another 18% said that they were at 50%. So I, I guess that's that's pretty indicative of what we're seeing in the market in general. All right, guys, uh, real quick before we do close things down, let's go ahead and do the drawing for the four twenty-five dollars Amazon gift cards. Our first winner today is uh, Ruby. Oh, congratulations, Ruby. Our second winner today is Brian M. Congratulations, Brian. Our third winner today is Yuri M. Congratulations, Yuri. And finally, our, our fourth winner today is uh, Antoine O, oh, congratulations to Antoine. We'll be following up with all four of you uh, by email to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see anything there, please check your spam folder. Uh, Shannon, Andy, uh, Dr. David Yates, uh, Thomas, and Dr. James Bland, thank you all for uh, a great, great conversation today. Lots of, lots of great takeaways. Really do appreciate uh, your sharing your expertise and your thoughts on compliance. I also, I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. Uh, for now, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody, and please, whatever you do, stay safe.